So the world is changing. Uh, you've heard about self-driving cars, um, and uh, that's one of the things that deep learning is really important for. Um, you probably already didn't realize, but uh, you're using deep learning when you're talking to your phone, and we're getting used to this. It's, it's just the beginning of a complete change in how we interact with computers, thanks to AI. Uh, I, I suppose many of you have heard uh, recently that uh, a deep learning, reinforcement learning system uh, beat the world Go champion just uh, in March this year. This is uh, our friends at Google DeepMind. Um, and so um, I think it's important that people understand a bit more what is behind this technology and um, uh, maybe go th see a little bit through the hype and uh, the fears that um, are, are uh, very often uh, discussed uh, on the internet. So I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about uh, where this comes from and uh, some of the motivations and, and a little bit of where, where we're going. I'm going to start about AI and what, what it means and uh, why machine learning is important for it. So for, for machines to be intelligent, that means taking good decisions. And in, in order to take good decisions, um, they need knowledge. Classical AI, before machine learning really take, took over, was based on the idea that we could just um, spoon feed computers with knowledge by formalizing the knowledge that we exchange verbally uh, by programming the computers with rules and, uh, and facts. And it, it didn't work because a lot of the knowledge that we have in, in our brain isn't something we can communicate easily and even less to computers. So the solution turned out that we let computers learn uh, a lot of uh, what they need to take intelligent decisions. And that's why machine learning is so important. So, um, you know, this in particular uh, highlights the fact that uh, a lot of the knowledge we have is implicit, is uh, things that we often call intuition that we can't really explain. You know, we know that this is the right thing to do, and maybe we even have a story, but this is clearly not the full story, because when we try to program computers with that story, it just doesn't work. So there's a lot missing uh, that usually comes under this, uh, this name of intuition. Uh, if you ask a, a champion Go player you know, why he's doing this, he's going to have a story. But if you try to really uh, use that information to, to program a computer to play Go, it just doesn't work. There's a lot of information missing that's implicit. And so uh, machine learning is about taking data uh, and, and learning how to uh, explain it in order to, uh, to build a kind of uh, a model that generalizes to, to new cases and then can be used for making predictions or taking decisions and actions. And the really basic way in which machine learning works is incredibly simple. Uh, we have a machine. The machine, say, has inputs and outputs. And um, it has parameters. So these are just numbers. You can think of them as knobs. And what we're going to be doing is very slowly and gradually change, turn these knobs so that the machine performs better the task we want. So we're going to show one example at a time. And with a very simple mathematical trick based on gradients, we can find out for each knob whether we should increase it a little bit or decrease a little bit so that the machine produces a, an answer that's slightly better, just slightly, slightly better. Right? And we do this over and over and over on millions or hundreds of millions, or in the case of language, billions of cases, and repeating over these cases many times. And it works. Um, that's also how our brain does it, for the most part. Uh, the, the most interesting, interesting things we learn are not just storing facts, but, but gradually learning by changing our model of the world um, to better fit everything we're seeing. So as Hugo said, uh, for this to work, for AI to come about thanks to machine learning, we need enough data. And we need enough data because the world is complex. And uh, to capture that complexity, all of the knowledge that we use to understand the world around us, we need equivalently enough information, enough data about it. 
right? So a lot of machine learning we're doing now is just not at the right scale for AI. Uh, we are often applying machine learning on very, you know, specialized tasks. Uh, to reach AI, we'll need systems that can actually encompass a lot richer sources of data with, you know, covering, uh, you know, all of the domains that, you know, humans are good at. And of course, in order to uh, process all that data and build models that are uh, large enough to, to capture all that knowledge, we need computational power. And what we have now is not enough. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on in uh, uh, building specialized hardware and, and setting up uh, uh, both chips and systems level uh, to enable maybe, you know, I think we're going to have a hundredfold speed up in the next few years, thanks to these uh, advances. And this is really necessary to, to move to the next stage of, of AI. Now, having data and computational power is not enough. Uh, we need the right algorithms. And uh, in machine learning, the algorithms we use basically encompass two things. One is sort of computational, they have to be efficient. And the other is more what we call statistical meaning that they, they allow the systems to, to generalize well, to really capture the essence of what's behind the data. And this is you know, one of the reasons why deep learning is so successful. There has been uh, a lot of other machine learning methods in the past which are very flexible and can take advantage of large quantities of data, but they just don't capture the high level abstractions that allow um, uh, the kind of generalization we're currently seeing with deep learning, but you'll see more hopefully in the future. So, um, so what, what's, what's deep learning about? It's about learning representations, and it's about learning multiple levels of representation. So the idea of learning representations has been there from the beginning of neural nets in the 80s, uh, it, but uh, people had failed to train deeper neural nets, and, and we understand now better, both theory, theoretically and conceptually, why it is important to have these multiple levels of representation. I'll say more words about that. Uh, it turned out that having these deeper nets enabled um, really breakthroughs in applications like speech recognition and computer vision. Um, and nowadays, a lot of work is going on with natural language, especially really understanding uh, the meaning of, of what people say. So um, it all, uh, this deep learning thing, uh, really is a renaissance of neural nets. And it all started about 10 years ago uh, with uh, research uh, being led by Jeff Hinton in uh, a group uh, funded by a Canadian organization called CIFAR, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, with uh, some of the uh, you know, main uh, groups being in Toronto with Jeff, uh, in uh, New York with Jan LeCun at NYU, and my group in Montreal. And, and for the first time, we found a, a, a recipe that allowed us to train these deep neural nets using unsupervised learning. And actually, Hugo, uh, who was doing his PhD in my lab then, uh, was part of that first paper we had in 2006 at NIPS, which was an oral and, uh, and made a lot of noise with uh, other papers from our colleagues. Um, and then there was, I think, another big change around 2010, 2012, uh, when we realized that we could train these very deep nets in a purely supervised way by just changing the kind of nonlinearities that we use. So we started using these rectifiers, and we had a paper in 2011 showing that using rectifiers, we could train deep nets uh, purely supervised way without using this first trick that we had found in 2006. And then the year after came uh, a big breakthrough in, in, in computer vision thanks to, uh, to this and, and other advances. Um, but, but before the, the, the computer vision breakthrough came, uh, these advances, these uh, the pretty amazing uh, progress in speech recognition. So this graph shows years and accuracy on a, on a speech recognition benchmark, a, a kind of cartoon, where we see that the, even though people had lots of data in the 2000 decade and, and bigger and faster computers, it really didn't help performance until uh, deep learning you know, kicked in. And we, we've seen, uh, I've seen, you know, using my phone, uh, you know, how much better speech recognition is now. I mean, it's especially the, the, the Android uh, OK Google thing is, is amazing. I mean, and it works for French, uh, which was not possible just a few years ago. Uh, it works with accents. It's, it's, it's really impressive. 
Um, and then, as I said, in 2012, um, thanks to GPUs, right, we've, we've heard about these, uh, uh, which at, at, at that time gave us about a 10 to 20 fold speed up, allowed us to train bigger models on bigger data sets. Uh, suddenly, uh, again, we saw this dip in performance using neural nets. But in the matter of uh, the last uh, three or four years, we actually, the error rate on, on this ImageNet benchmark, I think I have another figure. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll have a figure later about that. Um, it has dropped with basically human level performance, uh, at least uh, this task, which I, I think is still far from doing as well as humans uh, for computer vision in general. Right, so I don't need to tell you that uh, this created a lot of fuss in the media, and it's, it's been growing exponentially since then, and that's why we have these kinds of meetings. There's a lot of interest. And of course, companies uh, started to uh, fight each other to buy smaller ones. Uh, and DeepMind was probably the first big story about this, uh, which was acquired by Google for around $500 million uh, or pounds. I'm not sure, I think the number is unclear. Um, so lots of companies have been investing and it's growing very fast, big ones, and of course a lot of small ones. Um, let me say a few more words about uh, why deep learning works. Uh, so this notion of depth, of having multiple levels of representation. Um, in the figure here, what you see is that the lower levels learn uh, local simple features like edges and, and then and then what units in the neural net uh, higher up do is they combine them to build um, more complex higher level uh, detectors, for example, of parts like eyes and, and, and mouths and so on. And then if you look higher up, you see units that detect uh, full faces. Uh, but what you don't see in the picture is that these detectors are invariant in the right way. So if I change the input by translating the image or changing the face in some, in some ways, uh, the, some detectors might, you know, will continue to, to fire. So the reason why deep learning is working is not because there's something universal about these neural nets. In fact, they're not. So if, if I take a random function that I try to learn with a neural net, it's not going to work. Um, it's going to work with a, an SVM as, if the function is smooth, but neural nets uh, work because the kinds of functions we're trying to learn have particular mathematical properties. Uh, essentially, they can be well described by composing pieces, just like engineers do when they, you know, build solutions. And, and this idea of composing pieces together is, is you know, essentially embodied in this uh, uh, hierarchy of features. So uh, not every uh, function we want to learn would have this property, but the world has this property. It's uh, you know, we can explain the data by underlying factors that are combined in various ways. And, and uh, because of this, uh, deep learning is, is working. Um, there are many really cool things that you, you can do when you start thinking about not just learning a function, but learning how to represent the data. And one of the first uh, examples of this uh, comes from Google, at, uh, on the Google image search, uh, work actually by my brother, Sammy Benjo. Um, is learning representations jointly for images and for, for words or, or texts. So remember each of these levels of uh, the neural net is actually a representation of the input. And, and uh, we can play games with those representations. And here the game we're playing is we're going to have a representation for a word like dolphin in the same space uh, as the representation for uh, images. And we're going to train these functions that map, say, a word to uh, a bunch of numbers, uh, or that map an image to a bunch of numbers, in such a way that the, the, the representation for dolphin, the bunch of numbers corresponding to the word dolphin, is going to be close to the representation for the image of a dolphin. Right, so now, of course, this is really useful for Google image search, because I can, uh, I can type uh, a word like Eiffel Tower and look in that space for images that uh, are like nearest neighbors uh, in that space. And of course, I could go in both directions, and that has been done in various papers, and, and it's pretty, pretty amazing and useful. 
And, and we use these ideas in many other contexts. For example, in my lab, we've worked a lot on machine translation. And we think of sort of semantic representations uh, for languages, for sentences uh, that are kind of universal. And you, you want to map from a sentence in French to this uh, representation, uh, potentially map that representation back to English or go in the other direction. So we think about these representations and going back and forth between the data and representations and allows us to kind of translate between different modalities. Uh, can we start the video? Thanks. So this, uh, this is actually now pretty old work uh, from a few years ago by, uh, by Jan Lecar uh, and his collaborators um, showing how the early convolutional nets uh, could be used to um, label each pixel in an image and, uh, and, and you know, of course, this is really important if you're going to be driving a car. Uh, nowadays, the systems that do these kinds of things are way more accurate. But, but mostly, it's the same technology, uh, trained with more data, with larger, much, much larger models. Um, OK, I'm going to move on. All right, so this is the figure I wanted to show earlier about the progress in, in accuracy on the object recognition. So this is the ImageNet data set, which started this uh, kind of computer vision revolution. Uh, after that uh, first jump, um, from the conventional computer vision systems in 2012 to the uh, first deep learning systems uh, using this in 2012, uh, there has been continued progress uh, to the point where we've essentially reached uh, human performance, at least numerically. I think uh, humans are still uh, much better at dealing with uh, you know, complications like uh, poor lighting and, and, and poor angles and, and unusual backgrounds and things like that. But it's still uh, quite impressive, of course. And this is fueling a lot of the uh, applications, that, such as the one we've just heard for effective computing. Um, I have this uh, timeline. Um, how am I doing with time? 17. 17 to go. OK, that's for the 35 mark? Yeah, that's for all right, so, um, so as I said, so the 2006 were the first papers uh, uh, showing that you could train deeper nets using unsupervised learning. Uh, in 2011, we, we have these results showing that you could do it in a purely supervised way by you know, toying with the nonlinearities that are used in those neural nets. Um, and then 2012 was this breakthrough that I mentioned for, uh, uh, on the ImageNet data set by our colleagues at Toronto, uh, Ilya uh, Sutskever and, and Alex Krzyzewski and Jeff Hinton. Uh, the first uh, really in interesting breakthrough in uh, reinforcement learning with uh, deep learning came in 2013 with the, uh, the, the DeepMind group uh, with their system for playing Atari games, which eventually you know, uh, reached a point of uh, beating humans at, at most of the games. Uh, and. Um, then we started seeing speech recognition being, being used in, in, in phones. Actually, it started even earlier. I think uh, the first uh, uh, prototypes of speech recognition using uh, deep learning actually came out in 2012. Um, and, uh, and nowadays, uh, over the last couple of years, we've had really amazing advances in machine translation using deep learning. Uh, this is something that we've done a lot in, in, in my lab. Um, you see the picture here of Kim Yung Cho, uh, one of my former postdocs who's now faculty at NYU, uh, continuing to work on this. And this year, uh, uh, we've seen uh, ImageNet uh, you know, reach, uh, performance uh, reaching human level. Uh, and, uh, and the Go uh, breakthrough just a couple of months ago. Uh, yeah, I started the video. And uh, this is an interesting uh, video from our uh, former colleagues from uh, AT&T from the 90s who are now working for NVIDIA uh, applying convolutional nets for uh, self-driving cars. So what you're going to see here is that this initially the system doesn't do that great. <laughs> so the human has to take over. But a couple of months later, after 3,000 miles of learning, that's what you get.
All right, let's move on to the next slide. Um, let me tell you about uh, another component. So I've talked about convolutional nets, and you've heard about them in the previous talk. Um, let me say a few words about a really interesting component uh, called recurrent nets. And uh, I've, I've worked a lot on recurrent nets. I, uh, I did work in, the, in my thesis in the early 90s um, on recurrent nets, in particular showed some of their limitations, uh, which unfortunately kind of uh, slowed the field and contributed to people dropping recurrent nets for um, about uh, a decade or two. Um, but then uh, in the last few years, there's been an amazing growth of research in recurrent nets. Uh, and they're really, really important as soon as you're dealing with sequential data. So that's text, that's video, that's speech, um, bioinformatic data, medical data, time series, uh, business data. No, I mean, it's everywhere we have sort of a sequential structure in the data. And um, what, what these uh, you know, neural nets do basically is they exploit the uh, very, very simple uh, assumptions about sequences that the same kind of computation that I'm doing for a particular time step, I can do for the next time step. But of course, the data is going to be different at the next time step. And so we are sharing information about how to process data. It doesn't depend which particular time step you are. It's, it looks like a, a very simple assumption, but you don't have that assumption if you were to use a normal uh, neural net. And of course, that allows these, these uh, neural nets to process sequences of very, various length, of varying length, and to generalize to new lengths that have never seen, been seen before. Um, so what, what they do, you see in the picture, uh, the little uh, pink boxes are the, like the neural net, really. The, the, and uh, it outputs a state. So a state is just a, a vector here that summarizes information that has been seen from the beginning of the sequence. And that state is going to be updated by seeing a new input, like a new image or a new letter or a new word. Uh, that's the XT. And the previous state plus the current input are going to be combined into this little neural net uh, to produce the new state. So now you see that this, the new state contains information about everything that happened before plus the new information XT. And that's going to feed the next uh, you know, computation. And I've shown only the input part of the recurrent net. So they, are, they can process a sequence of things and, and extract a kind of summary of what they've seen in their state. And of course, they can also output things. I haven't shown that. But you can use them to generate, say, a sequence of words or generate a sequence of, of sounds or, or potentially images uh, when we are able to generate nice images. Um, so everything that has to do with sequential data, you know, these are a part of it. And now people have, have come up with all kinds of interesting variations on their architectures. This is like the, the basic vanilla architecture. But for example, in my work on machine translation, we use what's called bidirectional recurrent net, in which we have a recurrent net flowing forward in time, another one flowing backward in time. And so at any point, you have the, the summary of the past and the summary of the future being combined to give you information about the whole sequence, but kind of centered at a particular point in the sequence. Right, so all, really all kinds of cool uh, variations on the structures of these recurrent nets allow us to, to do things that we, we, we didn't know how to do just a few years ago. Um, so one of the things that really impressed me in the last few years is the progress we've made in natural language generation. So I really did not expect that a couple of years ago that we would be able to use these recurrent nets to generate sentences in English that look right, that look right both grammatically, semantically, and, uh, and, and that we could generate those sentences in a uh, contextual way. So here, this is caption generation. Uh, you may have seen some examples of this uh, kind of technology before, where the, the neural net is doing two things, really. It's reading an image. This, so this is using the convolutional nets you've heard about. And, uh, and, and so the convolutional net is extracting features of the image. And then it's generating a sentence in English by generating one word at a time. So here we have a recurrent net that produces one word. And then given that word and given the context of the image, produces the next word, and so on. And, uh, and you get things like this. So uh, I don't know if my pointer works. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. 
uh, so, so the computer sees this image and it says, a woman is throwing a frisbee in the park. Um, and what I'm showing here in the second image is um, a display of the attention mechanism that we're using in this particular model that we've developed in my lab, where when it says a, particular, when it says a word in a sentence, it's looking in the image and it can choose to look in various places. And here, when it's saying the word frisbee, the underlined word, uh, it's, it's actually looking in, in you know, the, the light area where the frisbee is, is. So for the second image, it sees this image and it says a dog is standing on a hardwood floor. And, and when it says dog, it's looking at the face of the dog. And we could run this uh, another time and an another sentence would come out, right? This is a, a probabilistic model so it, we can generate sentences. Uh, it's really creating those sentences. This is not a copy of a sentence that the human typed, right? The third image here, uh, you see uh, it says a stop sign is on a road with a mountain in the background. And when it, it talks about the stop sign, uh, it, it's, it's looking where the stop sign is. Um, now, unfortunately, when we did this study, we didn't have that much data in terms of uh, the language part. Uh, and so it also makes a lot of mistakes. So sometimes the mistakes are more interesting because we can learn how to fix the models. And, um, and it's also fun. Uh, so you also also shows you that we are far from AI. Uh, so it, it sees this image and it says a large bird standing in a forest. Of course, it's not a bird; it's just uh, two giraffes. And maybe if you squint, you can think that it's a bird. Um, this one is maybe more interesting. Uh, it says a woman holding a clock in her hand, and uh, and indeed, uh, when it says clock, it's looking at this uh, pattern on her shirt, which is circular and has letters around, which could be interpreted as a clock again if you don't look too carefully. Um, so this, these are kind of reasonable errors, but sometimes it makes crazy errors. Like this one, it says a man wearing a hat and a hat on a skateboard. Um, yeah, just totally crazy. Um, but um, can you start the video? Uh, if you train these kinds of things with a lot more data, nope, this is just move to the next, just yes, thanks. Um, then you can get these kinds of things. Yes. This is from uh, our friends at Facebook Research. Typing. So Jan Lukens group. Yes. Are they smiling? Yes. Is there a baby in the photo? Yes. Where is the baby standing? Bathroom. What is the baby doing? Brushing teeth. What game is being played? Soccer. Is someone kicking the ball? Yes. What color is the ball? Yellow. So the numbers you see are the confidence that it's giving to the leading uh, answers. All right. Um, so what's next? Um, one of the really exciting areas uh, moving forward is to, to go from the traditional uh, turf of neural nets, which is pattern recognition, classification, to something more cognitive, like reasoning, something that, you know, Traditional AI thought, traditional AI uh, researchers thought was, you know, the things you, you couldn't do with machine learning that would, inv would have to involve sort of logic and, and, and symbolic computation. So uh, in the last couple of years, there's been really uh, a lot of progress in this. It's still a uh, toy task that we're handling, like reading 
uh, a story like this, like Sam walks into the kitchen, Sam picks up an apple, Sam walks into the bedroom, Sam drops the apple, and then answering the question like, where's the apple, and, and the answer is the bedroom. So, so this kind of thing is, is the kind of task that people are, are looking at and, and expanding to more realistic uh, data uh, as we speak. Um, if we look a bit further on the horizon, uh, I think there are really a lot of uh, opportunities for, for, for the, the, this, this progress in AI. One of the most uh, important is probably how we interact with computers. Uh, as computers become smarter and more importantly able to understand what we say sufficiently, it's going to change the way we interact with computers. It's going to make uh, the internet and, and computers accessible to a lot more people that are currently not you know, too comfortable with, with uh, technology, uh, including in the third world. Um, and that includes things like machine translation, but natural language understanding, uh, and incorporating the visual aspects, so the, you know, the effect of computing, for example, looking at the person and using that information to interact with the person in, in, a, in a much better way than we currently, and less frustrating way that we currently uh, experience. Uh, maybe um, affecting people's lives in a uh, deeper way somehow is the uh, progress that a lot of people are seeing uh, in applying deep learning to healthcare. The way that uh, medicine works right now in terms of the statistical aspect of it and deciding you know, what treatment is good for you is, is really primitive. It's based on very little data. Um, uh, a few dozen people you know, try a drug and uh, others uh, have a placebo. And, and if, if the drug is uh, performing slightly better than the placebo, then uh, you know, the, the drug is going to be commercialized. We won't know if the drug is better than another one. And we won't know if it's really the right thing for you with your genome and your specifics and your history. Um, there's so, so much data that is being collected now about people's uh, health records and how the choice of a treatment could influence the, uh, the outcome. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that we'll see a lot of development in this area. There's a lot of investment as well, probably billions right now, uh, for, for obvious reasons, because the, you know, it could completely change the way medicine is done. And another area that we're seeing uh, rapid growth is everything having to do with robotics. Uh, used to be that uh, there wasn't much machine learning really in robotics, and this is changing very, very rapidly. And, and of course, again, there could be uh, major applications starting with the self-driving cars and, and other uh, fun things. Um, in terms of research challenges, um, Hugo mentioned dense provides learning. Uh, this is one of the things that I work hard on. Um, and it's, it's really an area where we see a big gap between humans' abilities and, and our current machine learning algorithms. Um, humans can uh, learn a lot of things about the world with zero supervised learning. So a good example uh, of that is uh, how, you know, by two years of age, a child really understands the, basic, the basics of physics. Uh, and you know what happens if I if I drop something, and uh, what happens with liquids, and what happens uh, with uh, objects around the world, and and nobody teaches them. Like they don't take classes about force equals max times acceleration. They just observe and interact with the world, and this is pretty much unsupervised learning. So our algorithms are really not at that level, and we need to uh, uh, explore that field so that. One day, computers can just learn about the world and how it ticks, how it works, by observing and interacting with it. So that's also connected to the progress we're seeing in reinforcement learning, uh, because often uh, you know, we have to take action in order to see uh, how cause and effect are related. Um, this is, again, something that's not sufficiently studied uh, currently in machine learning, but, but clearly is, is important for, for you know, children learning and, and human learning. One area that uh, is, uh, you know, less discussed uh, that I care a lot about is uh, having better models of, um, of sequences in terms of the multiple time scales that are involved and long-term dependencies. This is something that we know is important, that, but we haven't made enough progress really on that, on that dimension. And, uh, and that in particular is going to be important for the last point here, which is, uh, building uh, sort of a semantic models of the world, uh, you know, climbing up the abstraction ladder. Right now, the abstractions that our, our models learn are pretty concrete and simple, but we need to go uh, much higher up. 
Uh, just to conclude, uh, if you want more information, I'm, as, as you heard, I, I've written a book with my colleagues, uh, Ian Goodfellow and uh, Aaron Corville, and uh, it's under the hands of MIT Press right now. Um, so hopefully it will come out uh, soon. And uh, we have this review paper in Nature, uh, uh, Jan and Jeff and I, that you can also look at. Uh, and we have this, uh, organized this conference, uh, which started three years ago, called iClear, uh, uh, where the number of attendees is growing exponentially fast, of course. Um, and this is a picture of some of the people in my lab to give you a sense of how, you know, uh, this is uh, growing fast everywhere, including in academia. Uh, the group right now has about uh, 85 people. All right, thank you very much.